Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. We have been asking witnesses if, if they're okay with it, if they would remove their masks because it's much easier for us to hear and, and certainly for the stenographer to get your testimony if that's okay. I'd be happy to, Your Honor. All right, Thank great. You. Thank you. All right, you may question the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Mayo. Good morning, Mr. Corrente. <clears throat> you ran for re-election in 2016, correct? I did. And you hired uh, Jeff Britt as a campaign consultant during that 2016 uh, election cycle, correct? I did. And you hired him sometime in the springtime, April, May? Sounds right. Okay. And among other things, uh, Mr. Britt was tasked with uh, overseeing the production of opposition research for the campaign? Um, I'm not aware of that right now. You didn't know that he was doing that? What I knew at that time, I did not know that in the spring, no. Among other things, Mr. Britt was also tasked with trying to develop Republican support for your campaign, correct? Uh, yes, he did some of that, yes. Okay. And among other things, he uh, interacted with people like uh, Colonel Doherty? If you say so, I'm not going to disagree. I'm not aware of that. Okay. You were aware that he interacted with John Hayes and White on your behalf? No, I have a good relationship with John Hayes and Way, and I did interact with him, but I, I believe that was me. Do you recall Mr. Britt uh, setting up a photo opportunity in a, some sort of a, a, a public relations event at TACO? Yes, we had a public relations event at TACO. Um, it, it, it may have been, Mr. Britt. Uh, honestly, I remember the event. Uh, it was a successful event. I, I don't know if it was Mr. Britt or not right now. And the means of compensating Mr. Britt, he was paid a monthly salary and he was reimbursed for all of his expenses, correct? He, he was paid, um, I believe we had a contract and I, I don't recall exactly how he was paid right now, but well, he, he was paid. You were the one signing the checks, right? Yes. And if Mr. Britt had to hire uh, other contractors to work on behalf of the campaign, he could do so with approval of your campaign, correct? I believe we talked about his fee at the beginning, and it was to serve as the consultant. We didn't talk about individual contractors and how they would be paid. Well, you were aware that he hired Mr. Pachette to do some investigative work, correct? No, I was not until later when he presented me with the report. I, I did not authorize it. I did not ask. I don't know who Mr. Pachette is. Never met him. Do you know whether or not Mr. Skenyon authorized it? I do not. So at some point you were handed a, a binder of opposition research that Mr. Pachette had put together, correct? I was provided with a binder of opposition research. I did not know who put it together. Did you ask? No, I did not. Were you curious? No, I was not. He, it, he summarized it for me. It was not anything interesting. I, I've never cracked the binder open on it. You were also aware that Mr. Britt, on behalf of your campaign, engaged the services of Ed Cotugno to do mail ballot work, correct? I learned that afterwards. Ed Cotugno was just an individual that was in the campaign. We had a lot of volunteers in the campaign. I'd walk in every afternoon, say hello to him, didn't even know his name and didn't really know his function for a long time. Uh, but later in the campaign, I realized that he was working on mail ballots and I, I didn't know if he was a volunteer or who was paying him. I, I didn't ask. He, he looked like a volunteer that was in the office working. Did you ever come to understand that he was being paid $7,500 to do mail ballots for you? No, but I later realized that he may have been under Mr. Britt's employ. And that would have been money that your campaign would reimburse Mr. Britt for? 
correct? No, no. Like I said, I believe, right now I believe that when I hired Mr. Brett, there was a contract price. Right. I don't believe that we reimbursed him for independent contractors. I still, to this day, don't know what Ed Cattunia was paid or not paid. You attended meetings with Mr. Cattunia, right? I probably did later in the campaign. As a, as a matter uh, of fact, I'm if, sorry. If I may, later in the campaign, I, at some point I did realize that Eddie Cattunio was working on mail ballots and I probably at some point figured out that he was under the direct employ of Mr. Brett, but that came much later and I don't even know if that was after the election was over or not, but it, it, was, it was close to that time frame. Do you remember Mr. Cattunio being summoned to your chambers in the State House to meet with you at the time that he was hired, you and Mr. Skenyon. In the spring before we no, hired? No, right after the primary. After the primary, Mr. I, no, I have no recollection of that. You don't remember meeting with him and Mr. Skenyon in your chambers? I do not recall that. 2016, Leo Skenyon was your chief of staff, right? Yes. And he also served, according to his uh, interview with the state police, he served as your de facto campaign chairman, right? Uh, I'm not going to agree to the characterization. Uh, he did a lot of work for my campaign, and I relied on him heavily. Who did he report to? Well, I'm not going to accept your characterization of report to. He spoke with me. I, I, I'm not characterizing anything. I'm talk, this is your campaign, right? Yes. Four years ago. Yes. Who did, your, who did Leo Skenyon report to? I'm not sure that he reported to anybody, but I had several conversations with him. He, he, we would talk strategy. He, you know, he was one of my campaign volunteers that I relied upon very heavily, and, if, and if that's what you're trying to ask. Okay, and you directed that no statements were to be made to the press without asking you first, correct? I don't recall that, but I would say that I generally handled statements to the press through my press person. Who was your press person? Patty Doyle. Okay, <clears throat> and you also had the final say on all campaign expenditures, didn't you? Yes. if they were brought to me. Now, during the course of that 2016 campaign, sir, your, cam your campaign put out something on the order of 50 or 60 mailers, right? It sounds like a big number, but it was probably accurate. And it was Mr. Skenyon who had the final review on each of those mailers before it went out, right? No, it was me. It was you. So you reviewed every one before it went out? I, I would say yes, but could a few of them have snuck through because there were so many and there was so much going on? It's possible, but uh, generally I reviewed all mailers before they went out. And am I correct in understanding from what other witnesses have told us that your campaign paid for all those mailers? Yes. <clears throat> How did you first find out about the mailer that was put out in late October by the Shauna Lawton campaign? Um, at this point, I don't have specific recollection of it, but I believe I was at my house, so... It may have been that I got it in the mail. I, I, don't, I don't recall. No recollection? No recollection. Do you remember seeing an article in the Providence Journal that Kathy Gregg wrote about the mailer? I probably did. Do I recall it right now? No. Did you have any... I mean, I, I remember getting the mailer. I, I, well, I remember 
learning of the mailer, uh, if that's your question. At some point, I learned about it. I believe it was around the time that it hit mailboxes. Um, and the reason that I remember that is I was angry with the mailer and I called my chief of staff, Leo Skenyon, and, and yelled at him because I, uh, I, was, I, was, I was angry at the mailer. I thought that it was not a good idea. I thought that it was going to hurt my campaign in the last days of the campaign. So that's, that's my recollection that I did learn of the mailer because I remember calling him and being so angry about it and actually yelling at him. It was a one-sided conversation. Um, and I believe that it was around the time that it hit the mailboxes. Now, whether I got it in my mailbox and saw it and got angry or whether someone called me and told me about it and I got angry, I don't know right now. In the course of your yelling at Mr. Skenyon or your, do you have a face-to-face -face meeting or is this on the phone? It was on the telephone. In the course of that conversation, did you ask Mr. Skenyon if he knew about the mailer before it went out? Nope, it was 100% a one-sided conversation with okay. me yelling at him. Were you curious to find out who in your campaign had been involved in it? I was angry at that point in time. Um, I yelled at him for a while, um, and then I immediately went into damage control mode and figured out how to get through the next week or two or however much time was left of the campaign because I believed that it was going to be damaging. In, in the course of that process, yelling at Leo and then going into damage control. Did you undertake to determine who among your campaign staff had been involved in the mailer? At some point, I'm sure I did. I don't recall that right now, but I'm sure I did, and nobody came forward and said that they had put out the mailer. Did Leo tell you that he had approved the mailer before it went out? Absolutely not. Did Matt Jerzyk tell you that he had typed up the content of the mailer? Absolutely not. Did Matt Jerzyk tell you that he had approved the issuance of the mailer by Brad Dufault? Absolutely not. Did Matt Jerzyk tell you that he had provided the information to Brad Dufault about what mailing list should receive the mailer? No. Did Patty Doyle tell you that she was asking questions in late October about whether there were any new developments with Shauna? Repeat that question. Sure. Did Patty Doyle was your spokesperson, right? Yes. Did she tell you that she had asked the question of whether there were any new developments with Shauna before the Providence Journal even picked up the story? I don't recall anything of the sort. Did Matt Jerzyk tell you that he had directed Brad Dufault to print the mailer but not mail it because he was trying to space out the timing of your mailers? No. You had a debate with Mr. Frias on November 5th of 2016, right? Well, repeat the date, please. November 5th. November 5? Yes. Would that be after the election? I hope not. Wouldn't be much of a debate, would it? That's right. What, what was the date of the election? Did you have a debate with Mr. Frias? I had a debate with Mr. Frias. I okay. don't believe it was November. Did you have a prep session with your campaign staff before that debate? I'm sure, yes. And one of the things that you covered in that prep session with your campaign staff was, what are we going to say about the Lawton mailer, right? I don't recall that right now, but I'm sure that was something that was probably covered if, if the mailer had hit at that point. I, I don't recall the timing sequence. Do you, have, do you have a recollection of what you decided to say about the mailer? I 
do not have a specific recollection regarding that. Whatever, whatever came out in the debate is public information. Mr. Mattiello, I've put up on the screen a copy of Exhibit DD, Dog Dog, which is a cover email to you from Richard Thornton. You understand Mr. Thornton is in charge of the Campaign Finance Division at the Board of Elections, right? Yes. And is this a full exhibit? Yes, it is. <clears throat> on November 9th, 2016, Mr. Thornton sends you this email making reference to a verified complaint that had been filed by the Rhode Island Republican State Central Committee in Brandon Bell, correct? I, I believe I received that letter. Okay. And in the second paragraph, Mr. Thornton says, as part of our investigation of the complaint, paren, see attached, copy, close paren, the board requests that you examine and respond to the allegation put forth in the complaint and submit a response to my attention no later than November 16, 2016, right? That's what it says. I've flipped over to the third page of that exhibit, sir, and it appears that uh, you submitted through your counsel. Incidentally, who was your counsel for this case? Michael DiCiro. You submitted through Mr. DiCiro uh, a response to the verified petition that Mr. Bell had filed, correct? Yes. Did you, did you review this before it was filed? I don't believe so. Is it your custom when you're, you're filing court documents to, to read them before they're filed? When I file them. But you understood that it had been sent to you for response, right? This, an answer to a complaint has a standard legal form. You're aware of that. I, it, I would have trusted my attorney to file the answer and I never reviewed this before I went in. Did you ever provide any information to him? Absolutely. Okay, so, so you discussed the complaint and what your answer was going to be with him before this was filed, right? You can answer that yes or no. Yeah. Repeat the question. Sure. Please. I'm not asking you to tell us anything that transpired between you and your lawyer. All I'm asking you, yes or no, did you talk with your lawyer about what should be in the answer before this was filed with the board? I had conversations with my lawyer about the facts of the case. He then wrote an answer. I, I assume it's in standard form. I never reviewed the answer. Flipping over to the second page of that answer, sir, I want to direct your attention to paragraph 13. And in paragraph 13, your response is as follows, quote, respondent asserts that the statements contained in paragraph 13 of the petition do not require a response from the respondent and leave petitioners to their proof thereof. 
to the extent any answer is required, denied, and furthermore, respondent did not willfully and knowingly arrange, coordinate, or direct Ms. Lawton to make an independent expenditure for her campaign mailer, nor did Mr. Britt willfully and knowingly arrange, coordinate, or direct Ms. Lawton to make an independent expenditure for her campaign mailer, close quote. Have I read that accurately? You have. Did you talk to Mr. Britt before this was filed? I did not. Do you know whether anybody did? I did not. What was your, what was your basis for including that statement? Objection. You're going to have to talk to Mr. DiGiro. I, I, it may just be in response to how paragraph 13 of the complaint was written, so he was just responding to that, but I, I don't know. You're going to have to talk to Mr. DiGiro. If I was the attorney, I might have done it differently. Yeah, let, let's not belabor a point where he's made it clear he had nothing to do with the document. His attorney prepared it. He had a conversation with his attorney before it was prepared. There's really not much else we can do with that, and you just read a paragraph to him. So let's not just churn through the same um, material that is already clearly been answered by the witness, and let's move on to a new subject rather than keep churning through the same information over and over again. I, I hear it the first time, trust me, I, I, I get it. Did you ever tell anyone that you believe that Jeff Britt acted without authority in connection with the Lawton mail? Repeat the question. Sure. Did you ever tell anyone that you thought that Jeff Britt acted without authority from your campaign in connection with the Lawton mail? Not that I thought he acted without authority, but that uh, when, when it became more apparent that the mailer was sent out and that he had involvement with it, I would have said that he had no authority. Did you fire him? I did not. In fact, you paid him a $10,000 bonus, didn't you? I don't recall if it was contractual, we did. And you asked him to work on your 2018 campaign, right? I did. I asked him to work on my 2018 campaign for the same exact reason I asked him to vote, uh, work for me in my 2016 campaign, because the word that I received, that he was either going to work for you or against you. I knew I had a difficult campaign, so I didn't want him working against me. I didn't want him working against me in 18. I was trying to get him on board uh, in 18 so that he would work for us. As it turned out, he did not work for us, and I believed he worked against us. Nothing further. Thanks. State wish to question the witness? Yes, Your Honor, briefly. Good morning, Mr. Maniel. Good morning, Mr. Danbrook. Mr. Maniel, you told us today that you hired Mr. Britt in 2016, then attempted to hire him in 2018 because you preferred he'd be working for you than against you. Why? Mr. Britt has a reputation of being able to work closely with the media. He does a lot of opposition research. Um, he puts out a lot of negative stories against people. Um, before the 16 campaign, a lot of people recommended him to me, and a lot of people told me to stay away from him. Um, my ultimate judgment was that I was going to have a difficult campaign and I didn't want Jeff Britt to work against me, so I hired him to work for me. It was a decision that I regret at this point. And his reputation with putting the stories out to the media, he doesn't do that like as an official press spokesperson, does he? No, he, I, the best way I can describe it uh, is he drops dimes and he tries to make connections. Sort of behind the scenes, 
Yes, his name is never in a story. Not transparent? No. And if I may, I'm not the first campaign that's hired him to, you know, to take him out of the, the inventory of people that can work against you. I believe a lot of campaigns have done the same thing. Sure. Now, with, you mentioned that the 2018 campaign, you anticipated that would be a close, close election, correct? I think I was referring to the 2016 campaign when I said that. So you knew going into 2016 that that was going to be a close election? Um, I, what I said, Mr. Danbrook, is I think I thought it was going to be a difficult election. I didn't think it was going to be as close as it was, and quite frankly, it was such a mismanaged campaign that that's what made it close. Um, I, I think if we ran a standard campaign without all of the drama, uh, that it, we would have had a much more comfortable victory. And would it be fair to say that you spent around and about $200,000 on that particular 2016 campaign? Uh, I'm not gonna, I, I don't know that that's the number, but it probably is, the, it's probably the number, yes. And we can agree, that's a lot of money for a state representative race. Is it's, that it's an awful lot of money, but when you're the speaker, it's no longer a state representative case. It becomes more like, it was more like a gubernatorial campaign. Um, when you're the speaker, they, you know, you, you just take on statewide significance, so it's much different than a, a, a rank and file rep campaign. So that would probably be the difference. But the group of voters that you're um, attempting to convince to vote for you is the same number of voters as it would be for any other representative in the House of Representatives, correct? It, it is, but the, the media attention and the significance that it takes on is just very, very different. It really takes on a state, it, it's a, it turns into a statewide race. Um, you mentioned that in the end it was close. Fair to say that you won by 85 votes? I believe that was the number. In fact, when the machine count was completed, you actually were behind. Yes. And you subsequently prevailed based upon those mail ballots that Mr. Katugno was working on. Yes. Hey, moving on. Sure. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Mattiello. Thank you. Anything else? Nothing else. Thank you. Thank you very much. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor.